was in the translation of maybe the Bible itself. You know, maybe somebody sees it one way or the other. Yeah, so different theories about translation. Uh, so that, that's one reason. Standardization of the, like, a text. So, like, was in the King James Version, like, made or, like, have a standardized form of the Bible for, like, everybody to read? Uh, no, that, that is a um, rumor, but actually there was multiple different editions of the King James Version that was published. Mm -hmm. So the one that was published in 1611, uh, then there was, update, there, there was constant updates. So uh, about every <coughs> 20 years or so, the, the, the King James Version that you go to Lifeway or wherever to purchase now, or, or uh, Walmart or Meyer or so, was actually the uh, edition that was published in 18... So it's early on in the 1800s. So it was actually, it was updated quite a bit from the, the original 1611 publication. I see, I noticed on the translation is more for, to be more politically correct mm -hmm. in terms of gender, how you address the gender. Yeah, so yeah, that's true. Uh, NIV, NIV. And if I, it changed, I mean, overnight. I was in there read my, <laughs> read one version and I always had the Bible and it was like, Two different versions. Yeah, um, so updates, and th I mean, there, there's a couple different things. Some of it could be for political correctness or other things, language changes. Yeah. You know, between uh, 1611, the King's English, and the English that we speak today, like, uh, I, I'm not able to understand a lot of the colloquial, uh, more slang kind of language that's in the KJV. Uh, in fact, when we read it, it's kind of funny some of the things that they say. You know, I remember when I was a kid growing up, uh, always laughing because of what the, the King James calls a donkey. So I'd be like, oh, hey, there's curse words in the Bible. <laughs> I was a little kid, right? So, updates in language. Um, there's, there's also uh, updates to the text based off of new manuscripts that, that we find. So sometimes that, that warrants uh, an updated uh, edition. Uh, or an updated translation. There's also um, a variety of different uh, age groups that you may want to provide uh, a translation for. So the NIV, for example, is written at a very uh, young reading level. I think it's at like a fifth or sixth grade reading level uh, for the NIV. So it's, it's very accessible if you're, if you're young. It doesn't use long, long, longer words and simplifies things versus uh, the, the King James Version is uh, like a 12th grade reading, reading level. It's probably, the, the grade level's probably gone up throughout the years because outdated language. Uh, the ESV is at like a 10th or 11th grade reading level. There's uh, longer words used. So, um, why do we have many different versions? Well, there's a lot of different reasons behind that. Uh, but, but what kind of principles do we think about when choosing the version that, that we should read? Uh, now, Kind of uh, just a little bit of clarification. In all these things, uh, they, they do say different versions. So there's the English Standard Version or the New International Version. But really, these are just different translations. If you if you compare and you can get uh, websites will do this for you, or you can actually get uh, an encyclopedia-sized <coughs> Bible that has three or four different translations in there, and you can have everything side by side, and you can see. And really, by and large, there's there's very small differences. Uh, almost everything it says basically exactly the same thing. Even our ESV that uh, came out in uh, the early 2000s compared to the King James that came out in 1611. And from the King James from 1611 to the one that we get now that's uh, the 1800-something edition, really most of it was uh, just updated things as far as there was uh, some typing errors. Um, there's a King James edition that was published, for example, that, that said that that was a typo, and it said, Thou shalt commit adultery. Anybody heard about that? It said, Thou shalt not commit adultery. <laughs> so there, there was a missing of a word, so they had to publish a whole new edition. So, um, but, but when you compare all these things, there, there's really very, very, very small actual differences uh, between them. So really we're talking about uh, the different editions or different editions of the translations. Uh, so most of them, or all of them, uh, are good for at least some purpose or another, and if it's in print, usually they're, they're really good translations as a whole. Uh, but, but what sort of principles 
uh, should we consider when choosing a Bible to, to read? Uh, should we read NIV or ESV or NASV or uh, uh, Christian Standard Bibles, CSB, I think, the new one that Lifeway. If you go to Lifeway, you'll see CSB Bibles all over the place. Uh, There's a new publication in the past year that's, that's came out. Uh, so what are some of the principles? Well, um, if, if you look at uh, a couple things, and I'm going a little bit off of uh, Paul Wegner. Uh, he talks about this in his book, uh, The Journey from Text to Translation. Uh, so he gives history into different uh, translations and editions uh, of the English Bible and of other vernacular Bibles, and going all the way back to the Greek and Hebrew. He talks about text criticism in there. It's, it's really thick book, a lot of good information. Um, but so I'm relying about some some of his stuff. Uh, but he says that uh, the, the translation that we use, and I agree with this, it should be based upon the the best manuscripts available. It should be, be based upon the best Greek and Hebrew manuscripts available. So when when you talk about uh, the the Greek text, for example, that there is a couple different uh, editions of the Greek text. So uh, what I have here is a Greek New Testament. Uh, this is the USB Greek New Testament. And it was probably published, I'm going to look to see, what, within what the US, past like 20 What USB so stand for? Uh, UBS, uh, oh, sorry, not USB, UBS, United Bible Society. Oh, okay. That's they what it stands for, United Bible <laughs> Society. And... Um, this is the fourth revised edition, so there's actually a fifth edition from uh, UBS that they, that they published. Uh, and this one, fourth revision uh, edition was, it says 1993 slash 2001, so I'm not sure if it's 1993 or 2001. Um, but this, this edition, uh, and there's a, there's a couple different editions of, of the Greek New Testament, but very, very minor differences I want to add. Um, a lot of it, a lot of the differences, if you open it up, you have the actual text up here, and then down here there's a, a lot of notes as far as manuscript notes, like, oh, hey, this manuscript family says this or this, or, or reader notes as well. So it helps you if there's a difficult verb that's not very common. Uh, this is a reader edition, so I'm not, I'm no Greek scholar. I, I can barely get by. It would take me probably 20 minutes to read just that one one little section right there, and I would have to have a dictionary in front of me to do that. Uh, so this kind of speeds up that, that process. Uh, you can take a look at that if you want. Um, so what, what happens is, is new manuscripts are, are found, and so then there is sometimes updates to the text or additional footnotes that are, are needed. Uh, now I don't have time to get into a full discussion of text criticism, uh, but if you want to learn more about kind of that process and what happens there, there there's an, an art form or a science form called text criticism. Uh, and it's kind of like a hermeneutics where it's its own thing as far as discipline, philosophy, and all this stuff. Uh, but, but it looks at different manuscripts and compares and contrasts any differences, uh, the similarities, spelling, all this stuff. And it's really, it's pretty interesting. Uh, but, but what happens is, over time, we, we discover new manuscripts, and so if you, if you look at just your English Bibles, most, most editions will have some uh, footnotes in there, or it'll say all, or this could also mean this, or, or some manuscripts say this. Uh, one classic example of that is the Lord's Prayer. Uh, so the Lord's Prayer in Matthew, some editions will have at the end, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever, amen. It's missing in the NIV. Yeah, and it's not included in the NIV. So what, what happens in that, and I think both the NIV and the KJV are being faithful in that. I think there's uh, important to say a, a footnote in that for either one. If, there, if it's the KJV uh, that includes it, I think there should be a footnote that says some manuscripts don't have this verse. Or if it's the NIV, it should say have a footnote and say some manuscripts have this. Well, is it original or is it not? Well. They're, 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 that's a long discussion of text criticism, but, but what happens is there's different families of, of texts, of, of Greek, New Test, uh, of Greek um, manuscripts, and these different families 
uh, manuscripts, some of them have it and some of them don't. So stuff like that happens in, in our Bibles. We get footnotes and all that stuff. Um, anyway, the, the translation that we use should be based upon the best manuscripts available. Now, I list uh, three popular, three of the most popular Greek manuscripts uh, that our English translations are going to be based upon. So, Textus Receptus. Has anybody heard of the Textus Receptus before? Textus Receptus is the edition of the Greek New, New Testament published by Erasmus in, I think, 1606, uh, a few years before the King James uh, Version was published. So Erasmus uh, was a scholar. He debated with Martin Luther. Uh, he, he, he was an excellent uh, scholar when it comes to, to language. Uh, and the Texas Receptus is, is really a, an amazing work from, from church history that we can go to. One guy uh, took different Greek manuscripts and put them all together into something kind of like that and published an edition of the, the Greek New Testament. Uh, it was, he mostly did it himself with, with little help from, from other scholars. And, and that, the Texas Receptus, is the, the base um, Greek text for the King James Version. So the King James Version is based off of the, the Texas Receptus, which was published in 16, I think it was 1606. You can, you can look it up, but it's early, just uh, early 1600s. I just threw the yes. thought in my head. I mean, when you say he did it himself, did he have like a, a couple of guy, scribes that worked with him or something? I mean, I'm trying to think this guy. He, he would Pick up Wagner's book and look through it and find the chapter on it. Uh, okay. I, I don't remember all the details. I'm just curious because, I mean, I'm thinking one guy, that would be a lot. It, it, it is. Uh, he was a scholar, and it is an amazing work of scholarship. Uh, I don't know how much help he did have, but I remember, one thing I remember is that he mostly did it himself uh, with, with little, little help. Uh, and, and that's why he's an amazing scholar when it comes to that. Um, so the Texas Receptus, Erasmus, when he published the Texas Receptus, it was based off of six manuscripts. Based off of six manuscripts. So when Erasmus was doing his work in... Uh, 1590s, 1600s, he had six manuscripts to, to work off of. Some will say he had an additional seventh, but about six manuscripts to work off of. The, the Nestle Allen and the uh, UBS are two of the more popular editions of the Greek New Testament today. Uh, the Nestle Allen and the UBS uh, four and Five. That's a four right there, so that's the, the previous, the prior edition than, than what they currently have. It's based off of about 8,000 different Greek manuscripts. Now, one thing that we could say from that is, well, I mean, there's a couple things to think of. More doesn't necessarily mean better, because you have more doesn't necessarily mean that they're, they're better, but there is a lot more helpful information by having more. You can compare and contrast and, and, and stuff like that. One other thing that's really helpful is when you look at the eight some thousand manuscripts that we have today versus Erasmus six is the incredible continuity between the eight thousand and some that we have today in Erasmus six over four hundred years of archaeology and discovering uh, more and more manuscripts that we have. Um, so if that if that sort of thing is interests you to learn about that more text criticism. You can look up text criticism and learn a little bit more about that. Uh, Wagner talks about that. Um, another book that's really cool is uh, Bruce Metzger's book. He talks about the Bible uh, and translation. He talks about how we ended up translating the Bible to all these different languages and so forth. Um, but the, the Bible that we use should be based upon the, the best manuscripts available. Uh, any questions on that? So does that mean that the King James is bad? Again, I don't think so. Uh, there, There is, uh, again, I would say amazing continuity uh, from scholarship, even uh, 400 years of scholarship, 
that we found of all these different manuscripts and basically no changes or very minimal changes with a couple of words such as at the end for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. You know, it's very minimal things like that, spelling changes, stuff like that. So, so that's some of the stuff that you see. Um, now, now why is that important? Well, that's important um, to have a text that is based on the best Greek and Hebrew manuscripts because uh, whatever translation that you use should be based upon and should go back to the original text. And the further back that you can go, the, the better it is to get back to the, the original text. Uh, the translation theory should also follow the theory that is most appropriate uh, for the use. <coughs> so the translation theory should follow the theory most appropriate for the use of the translation that you're, you're using. So there's a couple different theories. And on the back, uh, on page two, uh, there I have a couple things. You have, um, I'm just going to write it down, word for word, combo, and DP. All right. So if I were to ask Iris to translate Nihal, how do you translate that? Um, I, I guess it depends what you want. First of all, I would, can say is it literally by the word itself or what is the purpose? So if you translated Nihal as you good, okay. yeah. would that accurately represent what I mean? No. But that would be a word for word Correct. translation. Correct. If you were to say, it means hello, yeah. then you have uh, what would be more of a dynamic equivalence. Um, there, there's kind of a, a continuum on that because Nihal is, is very, um, I don't know what's, what's the best word for it, it's, it's a little bit euphemistic um, in, in the way that it's said. But um, you, you can take that example and, and go time and time again. Now, now a word for word translation over here as far as on translation theory, if you have a continuum uh, of this, word for word, a true word for word translation is really an inter interlinear Greek or interlinear Hebrew and in English Bible. You can get those, uh, but if you get those, it's very unhelpful unless you've studied uh, Greek and Hebrew grammar because there is no one for one equivalence. You can't translate any language exactly word for word and, can, and hold and convey the same meaning. You can't say the same thing in two different languages when it comes to something as significant as uh, a body of text like, this, like uh, the Bible and can say word for word and have the same meaning. And the reason being is just grammar and syntax, it doesn't, it doesn't work. But when uh, you talk about translation theories, so I'll just put my name here uh, to enter. And I'll be the So an interlinear, you got the, the Greek text, the Hebrew text, and then underneath you have like the, the word in, in English. That would that would be an interlinear. Um, And then, typically when people are talking about, so if you pick up a book on hermeneutics and talks about translation theory, usually when they say word for word, you're typically uh, talking about the, the theory that says that whenever possible, uh, when you're, you're translating, you should retain the same word order and you should have and use the same words whenever possible. When you're, when you're translating, for example, the Hebrew or the Greek word, for uh, brothers. You should, in every case, when, when that word comes across, you should have an English word that you use for it whenever possible. And whenever possible, it should also follow um, a, the same order. So for example, if it, the text says Jesus Christ, in English you would say Jesus Christ, and not reverse it to say Christ Jesus. 
uh, or, or any, any other example that you can take. So it should follow most of the word for word order. Now when it comes to a dynamic equivalence, or the theory of, di di the translation theory of dynamic equivalence, basically it's the change from a, a word for word translation to a thought for thought translation. So word for word versus thought for thought. And the more that you move towards a thought for thought sort of translation, the more you move away from a translation to an interpretation. Um, so, for example, uh, the word order, when, when you're doing a dynamic equivalence, the word order doesn't matter. I could go in, in any different word order. Um, you could, uh, you, you could you translate one word in multiple different ways, uh, so there, there's no necessary uh, desire or value to have the same word in English translated each time for the same word in Greek um, or the same word in Hebrew. So it doesn't really doesn't really matter. The, the, the main principle is you're getting the idea uh, of what the author is saying. And along this continuum, we have different English versions that kind of follow closer to this and closer to this. So if I were to bring out, for example, uh, the New Living Translation, the NLT, where do you think it would fall along this? And it, obviously a combo is, is kind of using both, um, somewhere a little bit of both. But, but along this continuum, if, if you were to look at an, an NLT, the New Living Translation, where do you think that would fall in this? Yeah, so the NLT, if you pick up an NLT, there's going to be a lot more difference between the NLT and the NIV versus the NIV and the ESV. Uh, the NLT is much more thought for thought, kind of paraphrase of what's going on. Um, NIV. Combo. Yeah, NIV is going to be a combo. And really, we're talking, when we say the NIV, there's two different NIVs. So you have the old NIV, that's kind of like here, and then you have the new NIV that kind of moves a little bit like a half step toward, towards this way. So what, what, do they have a version? What year they start moving more? 2012. What? 2012. 2012. Okay. So they, they published, and if you look on your phone on the Bible app, the edition of NIV that I'll bring up, or if you buy an NIV now, mm -hmm. uh, it's going to be the 2012 edition. Unless you, some, some apps will actually have both of them on there, and they'll have a, a date behind it. Mm -hmm. And I think the other one, maybe it was published in 72? Sound about right? But, but the, the, the older NIV was published somewhere in the 70s or 80s, and then the new one was published in, in 2012. Mm -hmm. Um, what about the New American Standard Version, in ASM? Hold <coughs> Huh? Hold Kind of, but it's definitely way over here. I just saw one. The one that you So, the, the NASB, if you ever pick up a New American Standard Bible and you start reading it, the grammar is really bad. And the grammar is really bad because uh, they, they very much so value a, whenever possible, the same word order from the Greek or the Hebrew should be retained. Hmm. And so that makes it for a very awkward English when you're, when you're reading. Perfect for Chinese. What's that? Perfect for Chinese. <laughs> yeah. um, what about ESV? More the dynamic. So an ESV is going to be kind of in between the, the NIV and the NASB. Um, and, and the reason the, the ESV falls a little bit closer towards a, a word for word, uh, it's able to do that uh, for a couple reasons. Well, one is that the values of, of the translating committee, the translation committee that was on there, wanted to publish more of a um, word for word translation, but they also have the freedom to use uh, bigger words um, and more complex grammar. Yeah, um, and, and so it's a little bit more 
complex to read. Uh, I, I personally, as, you, as most of you know, I really like the ESV and, and how it, it does that, but it is at a higher, a higher reading level than the NIV. The NIV is very accessible. Uh, but they, they, and that was really one of their strong goals was to make it very accessible. The the ESV wasn't necessarily targeting like a fifth or sixth grade reading level, so it could have a little bit more complex grammar or bigger words, more Christianese, so to speak. Uh, so, for example, uh, Romans three uh, in verse twenty five. Um, it says in the ESV, pull it up. Romans 3.25. Um, the ESV, talking about Jesus, says, Whom God put forward as a propitiation. So that's just one example of whom God put forward as propitiation. I believe the NIV translates it as a atoning sacrifice or a sin sacrifice maybe or something something, something to that extent. Uh, in the Greek, there, there was one word that, that conveyed that idea. So that that one word in, in Greek was able to be translated over into English by the word propitiation. But we don't use that. We, we, we're never going to use that word unless we're, we're talking about Christ. I mean, very, 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 very rarely would you ever use that word outside of that. Um, so, so you have that. Um, what about KJV? Which one? King, King James Version. More to dynamic equivalent. So the King James Version is also going to be somewhere right around here uh, with the ESV. So it's going to be very close to a, a word for word, but which also makes it um, somewhat awkward in the grammar uh, as well, maybe even was in that day. I'm not an expert on 16th century English, but the grammar is a little, little awkward in English. Um, so which then translation should use? Well, that depends on um, what your purpose is. Uh, over here, you also have in the dynamic equivalents, you have the, the message Bible, um, the combo of the CSB that was recently published, or the uh, HCSB, probably probably a little bit further actually towards this, this way, so I'm going to get that. Uh, probably under the new NIV, or maybe even a little bit further over, as far as more of a thought for thought uh, sort of thing. I don't know if there's, I missed any kind of mainline things, but our mainline editions. Anybody else think of any mainline editions or anybody else use something I didn't already talk about? Um, but, but the dynamic equivalents, New Living Translation message, uh, more paraphrase sort of things. Um, so, so, so what should you then read? Well, uh, each of these different sort of theories or, or versions that we have are going to be better for different purposes. Uh, so I, I've had many people recommend, and I, I think I agree with this, uh, more of a dynamic equivalence even to the point of the message or the NLT is really good for somebody uh, who is learning English or for somebody um, who is not a Christian, who's a seeker and wanting to read the Bible by themselves. And the reason that they say that is because the NIV, uh, even still, even though it, it still seeks to be a very accessible level, it still uses Christianese. It still uses things like atonement. Like that, the NIV will still use atonement. Uh, or things like that versus where the NLT and the message will not. Um, so, so they say for that purpose, you know, the paraphrase is good. Also, if you're really tired at night and, you, you know, you're wanting to do your devotions, you're really tired or you just woke up um, and you're not wanting to think really well, so then, you know, maybe, maybe a paraphrase would be uh, a good uh, addition to use because it's, it's simple and you don't have to think, think a whole lot. Uh, but if you're, if you're preaching or if you're, you're teaching, then the further over this way is going to be, is going to be better because uh, there may be 
meaning and significance when you're doing a Bible study, when you're really getting into the, the nitty gritty of the text, that, that, that may be important. The, the word order may be important, or there may be a, a sort of emphasis that, that is as being shown in the text, but you would only see it if you're uh, looking at, you know, it, maybe you would miss it if you had uh, an NLT versus an ESV or an NIV. The Amplified Bible, I would have to look it up to know for sure, but I'm pretty sure that it falls under a, a dynamic equivalence or very close to it. You know, looking on my uh, my phone here, you know, where, where you got the Bible app, it, it's unbelievable how many translations there are of the Bible. I didn't realize there was that many. Now I'm just flipping through here, there's probably a hundred. Yeah, yeah. You know. Definitely. If you um, pick up this book, uh, I mean, even from the King James Bible, you also have the Geneva Bible, the Matthew Bible, the Great Bible. Uh, so even before the KJV, there is several editions. Uh, William Tyndale was uh, the first one to start translating the Bible into English. And um, he, he almost finished a, a New Testament, uh, the, the Tyndale New Testament. You can find a Tyndale New Testament. Um, it's still some, some places still publish it. Uh, but it was finished by some of his, his disciples a little bit later on, but he did most of that. Uh, which, by the way, Tyndale, uh, the, the English uh, of William Tyndale, we, we still use that a lot. He, what, he, year, what year? What, what year? You said it was before the King James. Yeah, William Tyndale would have been um, 1500s or 1400s. So uh, a couple other things. Um, some editions uh, are, are published for particular theological reasons. Uh, so for example, Jehovah's Witnesses have uh, their own translation uh, of scripture that they use. Um, Mormons, I think, do as well, but I'm not, I'm not certain. So they give you their, their Bible, it's Bible. What's that? They gave you the, their version of the Bible, but it is Bible, but they have their own translation. Okay. Yeah, so um, the uh, Jehovah's Witnesses, the version that they use, and I forget which version it is, I'd have, I'd have to look it up, is, uh, is very, very similar, uh, but there's some differences in, in some areas. Uh, so Colossians 1, for example, there, there is a difference in Colossians 1 and how they handle that. Um, so... Uh, Colossians 1 in the Greek uh, says all the fullness was pleased to dwell. Uh, you have to look at context to kind of figure out well, what, what does Paul mean there. Uh, so, so the fullness of deity or the fullness of God, uh, uh, there is not a Greek word there in that text for, for God or for deity. So then you have to look at the context to kind of figure out well, what does Paul mean. And then in English, we, we, can, we put that in there. So, um, and, and I, think it's, I think it's appropriate. I think it's what Paul means when he says all the fullness was pleased to dwell. Uh, but it's just kind of a, a weird grammatical which thing. Verse, which words is that? Chapter 1, verse 2. Colossians 1, maybe 16. Is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation? No, not verse 16. Um... Verse 19. Verse 19. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. And again, I do believe, and, and most scholars will say that is a, a faithful rendering of what the, the Greek is saying there, but it's more it, in Greek. The what is the fullness is, is left to the context, the, the New Testament context. What does the Jehovah's Witness Bible say that's different? I would have to look it up. Oh. Uh, I do know they do something different there, but I, I can't remember offhand. And I also cannot remember what edition they use either, or what, what their publication is. Um, if somebody wanted to look that up, that would, that would maybe be helpful.
You mean the phones? Uh, no, the addition that Jehovah's Witnesses use scripture. And we can look at Colossians 1 and see what they say. Or if that's something that interests you, maybe go home and, and look it up and see, see how they handle that. Um, how about the Mormon yeah. religion? They believe uh, in the Old and New Testament basically Sorry. the same way we do. What they did differently was they, uh, uh, the Book of Mormons, mm -hmm. which is beyond that, it don't, you know, they say it doesn't contradict the Bible itself. But, uh, you know, when you're really talking to them, they believe basically the same way we do, except they go further with it. Mm -hmm. Which verse was it? 19. Verse 19. Uh, it says, because God was pleased to have all fullness to dwell in him. It says, all fullness to dwell in him. I think I, it says J.W. I'm assuming that's Jehovah's Witness. Uh, I just said yes. Jehovah's Witness Colossians, and that's what came out. Yeah. I, I'm not promising you that's the version. If it's JW.org, that, uh, that is their website. So it's, it just says because God was pleased to have all fullness to, what, to dwell in him and through him. Was the next verse to reconcile to himself all of the things. It does sound different by making peace through the blood that he shed on the torture stake. Torture stake is of the cross. Whether the things on the earth or the things are in heaven. Interesting. They call it a torture stake. Okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> question and answer so um, that's all I have prepared as far as English translations